Hello, 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 and good morning. Let's get started. Chapter 3 Men for the Farms of Mars. To a native Earthman, Earth meant Earth. It was just the third planet from the Sun which was known to the inhabitants of the galaxy as Sol. In official geography, however, Earth was more. It included all the bodies of the solar system. Mars was as much Earth as Earth itself was, and the men and women who lived on Mars were as much Earthmen as though they lived on the home planet. Legally, at any rate. They voted, voted for representatives in the all Earth Congress and for planetary president. But that was as far as it went. The Earthmen of Mars considered themselves quite a separate and better breed, and the newcomer had a long way to go to be accepted by the Martian farm boy as anything more than a casual tourist of not much account. David found that out almost at once when he entered the farm employment building. A little man was at his heels as he walked in. A really little man. He was about five feet two, and his nose would have rubbed against David's breastbone if they had stood face to face. He had pale red hair brushed straight back, a wide mouth, and the typical open-collar, double-breasted, over, all and hip-hop, hip-high, brightly covered boots of the Martian farm boy. As David headed for the window over which glowed the legend, Farm Employment, footsteps rattled about him, and a tenor voice cried out, Hold on there! Decelerate your footsteps, fella! The little man was facing him. David said, Is there anything I can do for you? The little man carefully inspected him, section by section, then put out one arm and leaned negligently against the earthman's waistline. When did you descend the old gangplank? What gangplank? Pretty voluminous for an earthy at that. Did you get cramped out here? I'm from Earth, yes. The little man brought his hands down one after the other, so they slapped sharply against his boots. It was the farm boy gesture of self-assertion. In that case, he said, I suppose you assume our wanting position, waiting position, and let a native attend to his business. David said, As you please. And if you have any objection to taking your turn, you can take it up with me when we're through, or any time thereafter your convenience. My name is Bigman. I'm John Bigman Jones, but you can ask for me anywhere in town by the name of Bigman. He paused, then added, That, Earthy, is my Conogman. Any complaints about it? And David said gravely, None at all. Bigman said, All right, and left for the desk, while David, breaking into a smile as soon as the other's back was safely turned, sat down to wait. He had been on Mars for less than twelve hours, just long enough to register his ship under an assumed name in the large subsurface garages outside the city, take a room for the night at one of the hotels, and spend a few hours of the morning walking through the domed city. There are only three of these cities on Mars, and their fewness was to be expected in view of the expanse required to maintain the tremendous domes, and supply the torrents of power necessary to provide the temperature and gravity of Earth. This, Wingrad City, named after Robert Clark Wingrad, the first man to reach Mars, was the largest. It was not very different from a city on Earth. It was almost a piece of Earth cut out and put on a different planet. It was as though the men on Mars, thirty-five million miles away at the very nearest, had to hide the fact that fact from them somehow. In the center of town, where the elliptical dome was a quarter of a mile high, there were even twenty-story buildings. There was only one thing missing. There was no sun and no blue sky. The dome itself was translucent, and when the sun shone on it, Light was uniformly spread over all its ten square miles. The light intensity at any region of the dome was small, so that the sky to a man in the city was a pale, pale yellow. The total effect, however, was about equivalent to that of a cloudy day on Earth. When night came, the dome faded and disappeared into starless black. But then the street lights went on, and Wingrat City seemed more than ever like Earth. Within the buildings, artificial light was used day and night. David Starr looked up at the sound, sudden sound of loud voices. 
Bigman was still at the desk shouting, I tell you this, this is a case of blacklist. You've got me blacklisted by Jupiter. The man behind the desk seemed flustered. He had fluffy sideburns with which his fingers kept playing. He said, We have no blacklist, Mr. Jones. My name is Bigman. What's the matter? Are you afraid to exhibit friendship? You called me Bigman the first few days. We have no black, Miss Bigman. Farmhands just aren't in demand. What are you talking about? Tim Jenkins got placed day before yesterday in two minutes. Jenkins had experience as a rocket man. I can handle a rocket just as well as Tim any day. Well, you're down here as a speed cedar. And I'm a good one. Don't they need cedars? Look, Bigman, said the man behind the desk. I have your name on the roster. That's all I can do. I'll let you know if anything turns up. He turned a concentrated attention on the record book before him, following up entries with elaborate unconcern. Bigman turned, then shouted over his shoulder, All right, but I'm sitting right here, and the next labor requisition you get, I'm being sent out. If they don't want me, I want to hear them say so to me. To me, you understand. To me, J. Bigman, J. personally. The man behind the desk said nothing. Bigman took a seat, muttering. David Starr rose and approached the desk. No other farm boy had entered to dispute his place in line. He said, I'd like a job. The man looked up, pulled an employment blank, and hand printed toward himself. What kind? Any kind of farm work available. The man put down his hand printer. Are you Mars bred? No, sir, I'm from Earth. Sorry, nothing open. David said, Well, look here. I can work, and I need work. Create galaxies. There are law against Earthmen working. No, there isn't much you can do in a farm without experience. I still need a job. There are lots of jobs in town. Next window over. I can't use a job in town. The man behind the desk looked speculatively at David, and David had no trouble in reading the glance. Men traveled to Mars for many reasons, and one of them was that Earth had become too uncomfortable. When a search call went out for a fugitive, the city of Mars were combed thoroughly. After all, they were part of Earth, but no one ever found a hunted man on the Mars farms. To the farming syndicates, the best farm boy was the one who had no other place he dared go. They protected such and took care not to lose them to the Earth authorities they half resented and more than half despised. Name? said the clerk, eyes back on the form. Dick Williams, said David, giving the name under which he had garaged his ship. The clerk did not ask for identification. Where can I get in touch with you? Landis Hotel, room 212. Any low-gravity experience at all? The questioning went on and on. Most of the blanks had to be left empty. The clerk sighed, put the blank into the slot which automatically microfilmed it, filed it, and thus added it to the permanent records of the office. He said, I'll let you know, but it didn't sound hopeful. David turned away. He had not expected much to come of this, but at least he'd established himself as a somewhat legitimate seeker after a farming job. The next step, he whirled. Three men were entering the employment office, and the little fellow, Bigman, had hopped angrily out of his seat. He was facing them now, arms carried loosely away from his hips although he had no weapons that David could see. The three who entered stopped, and then one of the two who brought up the rear laughed and said, Look as if we have Bidsman, the mighty midget here. Maybe he's looking for a job, boss. The speaker was broad across the shoulders, and his nose was flattened against his face. He had a chew-to-death, unlit cigar of green Martian tobacco in his mouth, and he needed a shave badly. Quite, Griswold said the man in front. He was pudgy, not too tall, and the soft skin on his cheeks and on the back of his neck was sleek and smooth. His overall was typical Mars, of course, but it was of much finer material than that of any of the other farm boys in the room. His hip-hop high boots his hip high boots were sprinkled in pink and rose. In all his later travels on Mars, David Starr never saw two pairs of boots of identical design, never saw boots that were other than garish. It was the mark of individuality among the farm boys. Bigman was approaching the three. 
his little chest swelling and his face twisted in anger. He said, I want my papers out of you, hens. I've got a right to them. The pudgy man in front was hens. He said quietly, You're not worth any papers, big man. I can't get another job without decent papers. I worked for you for two years and did my part. You did a blasted lot more than your part. Out of my way. He tramped past Big Men, approached the desk, and said, I need an experienced cedar, a good one. I want one tall enough to see in order to replace a little boy I had to get rid of. Big Men felt that. By spicy, yelled, you're right. I did more than my part. I was on duty when I wasn't supposed to be, you mean. I was on duty long enough to see you go driving wheels over sand into the desert at midnight. Only the next morning you knew nothing about it except that I got heaved for referring to it, and without reference papers. Hens looked over at his shoulder, annoyed. Griswold, throw that, he said, throw that fool out. Big Men did not retreat, although Griswold would have made two of him. He said in his high voice, All right, one at a time. But David Starr moved now, his smooth stride deceptively slow. Griswold said, You're in my way, friend, I've got some trash to throw out. From behind, David Bingman cried out, It's all right, Earthy, let me at him. Let him at me. David ignored that. He said to Griswold, This seems to be a public place, friend. We've all got the right to be here. Griswold said, Let's not argue, friend. He put a hand roughly on David's shoulder as though to thrust him to one side. But David's left hand shot up to ca catch the wrist of Griswold's outstretched arm and his right hand straight armed the other's shoulder. Griswold went whirling backward, slamming hard against the plastic partition that divided the room in two. I'd rather argue, friend, said David. The clerk had come to his feet for yell. Other desk workers swarmed to the openings in the partition, but made no move to interfere. Big Min was laughing and clapping David on the back. Pretty good for a fellow from Earth. For the moment, hens seemed frozen. The remaining farm boy, short and bearded, with the pasty face of one who had spent too much time under the small sun of Mars, and not enough under the artificial sun lamps of the city, had allowed his mouth to drop ridiculously open. Griswold recovered his breath slowly. He shook his head. His cigar, which had dropped to the ground, he kicked aside. Then he looked up. His eyes popping with fury, he pushed himself away from the wall, and there was a momentary glint of steel that was swallowed up in his hand. But David stepped to one side and brought up his arm. The small, crooked cylinder that ordinarily rested snugly between his upper arm and body shot down the length of his sleeve and into his gripping palm. Hens cried out, "'Watch your step, Griswold! He's got a blaster!' "'Drop your blade,' said David." Griswold swore wildly, but metal clattered against the floor. Bigman darted forward and picked up the blade, chortling at the stubbled one's discomfiture. David held out his hand for it and spared it a quick glance. Nice, innocent baby for a farm boy to have, he said. What's the law on Mars against carrying a force blade? He knew it as the most vicious weapon in the galaxy. Outwardly, it was merely a short shaft of stainless steel that was a little thicker than the haft of a knife, but which could still be held nicely in the palm. Within it was a tiny motor that could generate an invisible, inch-long, razor-thin force field that could cut through anything composed of ordinary matter. Armor was of no use against it, and since it could slice through bone, bone as easily as through flesh, its stab was almost invariably fatal. Hens stepped between them. He said, Where's your license for the blaster, Earthy? Put it away and we'll call it clits. Get back here, there, Griswold. Hold on, said David as Hens turned away. You're looking for a man, aren't you? Hens turned his back, his eyebrows lifting in amusement. I'm looking for a man, yes. All right, I'm looking for a job. I'm looking for an experienced cedar. Do you qualify? Well, no. Have you ever harvested? Can you handle a sand car? In short, if you're just 
if I may judge from your costume. He stepped back as though to get a better overall view. An earthman who happens to be handy for blaster, I can't use you. Not even, David's voice fell to a whisper, if I tell you that I'm interested in food poisoning. Hen's face didn't change. His eyes didn't flicker, he said. I don't see your point. Think harder, then. He was smiling thinly, and there was a little humor in that smile. Hen said, Working on a Mars farm isn't easy. I'm not the easy type, said David. The other looked over his rangy frame again. Well, maybe you're not. All right, we'll lodge you and feed you. Start you with three changes of clothing and a pair of boots. Fifty dollars the first year, payable at the end of the year. If you don't work out the year, the fifty is forfeited. Fair enough. What type of work? The only type you can do. General helper at the chow house. If you learn, you'll move up. If not, that's where you'll spend the year. Done. What about Bigman? Bigman, who had been staring from one to the other, squawked, No, sir, I don't work with that sand bug, and I won't advise you to, either. David said over his shoulder, How about a short stretch in return for papers of reference? Well, said Bigman, a month, maybe. Hen said, Is he a friend of yours? David nodded. I won't come without him. I'll take him to then one month, then he's to keep his mouth shut. No pay except his papers. Let's get out of here. My sand car's outside. The five left, David and Bigman bringing up the rear. Bigman said, Now you're a favor, friend. You may collect at will. The sand car was open just then, but David could see the slots into which panels could slide in order that it might be enclosed against the drifting dust storms of Mars. The wheels were broad to minimize the tendency to sink when crossing the soft drifts. The area of glass was reduced to a minimum, and, where it existed, merged into the surrounding metal as though they had been welded together. The streets were moderately crowded, but no one paid any attention to the very common sight of sand cars and farm boys. Hen said, We'll sit in front. You and your friend may sit in back, Earthmen. He had moved to the driver's seat as he spoke. The controls were in the middle of the front partition, with the windshield centered above. Griswold took the seat at Hen's right. Bigman moved into the rear, and David followed him. Someone was behind him, and David half-turned as Bigman called suddenly, "'Watch out!' It was the second of Hen's henchmen who was now crouched in the car door, his pasty bearded face snarling and taunt. David moved quickly, but it was far too late. His last sight was that of the gleaming muzzle of a weapon in the henchman's hand, and then he was conscious of a soft purring noise. There was scarcely any sensation to it, and a distant, distant voice said, All right, Zucas, get back in and keep watch, in words that seemed to come from the end of a long tunnel. There was a last momentary feeling of motion forward, and then there was complete nothingness. David Starr slumped forward in his seat, and the last signs of life about him vanished. And thus ends this chapter. Now, I think it's fair to say that she's probably not going to die here, given that it's uh, three chapters in, and the other books are still called Star, unless they're about other people. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> hope you enjoyed, and the next part comes out Tuesday. Bye!